software, Hilson Moran, Bizria, Train, EcoSense, and Kingspan. Uh, we really appreciate their support and sponsoring uh, our chapter. Also, we have got a new member, Benonia Tinambu. Benonia, if you are here, say hello. You can turn your camera on as well. It's a new member. Hi, everyone. Um, unfortunately, I'm not camera ready today <laughs> because of the short notice. So please forgive me. Maybe next time I will show my face. OK, thank you very much, Pernonia. Thank you. OK, next, Darren, our president-elect, will introduce the speaker. Darren, over to you. Hey, thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Stuart Gadsden. Stuart Gadsden. And thanking him for the valuable time that he's providing. I'm getting a bit of feedback here. Sorry if you can hear an echo. Um, so, yeah, so just to int introduce Stuart, Stuart has over 20 years' experience of studying and working in the field of renewable energy. Following his PhD, he worked as a consultant engineer before becoming operational manager at a renewable energy installation company and then product manager at a global heat pump manufacturer. Stuart joined Kenza in 2015 as technical sales manager, focusing on shared ground loop ground source heat pump systems within the residential sector. He is now director of sales in the southeast region. Um, so Stuart, yes, thank you ever so much for joining us and uh, giving up your valuable time for the chapter members. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Darren. Let me go for the sharing option and hopefully this will work. Is that visible to everyone, Darren? It is. You're you're still we can see the slide, different slides to the left. Okay, let me get out that view. Is that better? Uh it's not changed. It's not changed just yet. Wonderful. What I will try and do then. Hang on, let me try a different way. Is that better? That's correct. Yeah, that's it. Correct. We can see the uh, single screen now or single uh, pane. Cool. Excellent. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for that introduction, Darren. Uh, delighted to, to be here this evening to present to you all. As Darren says, I'm Stuart Gadsden, Director of Sales in the Southeast for Kenza Contracting Limited. Kenza uh, is a manufacturer of ground source heat pumps, and we manufacture them from our uh, factory in Cornwall. If anyone is ever passing Cornwall and we don't have any COVID restrictions, then we'd always be delighted to show people around the, the factory. So you can actually see heat pumps made uh, in, in Britain for yourself. And that is that's a genuine offer. So, you know, my contact details are there. As I say, if anyone ever wants to see ground source heat pumps being manufactured, we'd be happy to show you that. Uh, but another thing that's a, a bit unique with Kenza, we don't just manufacture the products. We are a contractor uh, and I work for the contracting side of the business. Uh, that part of the business has been going for nine years, the whole company since 1999. And in that time, uh, over the past nine years, we've installed about uh, 2,000 to 3,000 ground source heat pumps. And Kenza as a company has sold over 8,000 ground source heat pumps in the UK. So we are the UK market leader. There's usually some sites uh, around the country where drilling work's happening and things are happening. So again, you know, when when restrictions ease, if people are interested in seeing this stuff for themselves in action, then hopefully at, at some point we could we could uh, have that opportunity to do one of these sessions live, for example, on the site. So what I'm going to chat to you today is about the technology, make sure everyone has a good understanding of ground source heat pumps, and then specifically focus on shared ground loop arrays and the, the benefits that we think they can bring to district heating. So very briefly, uh, run through what I'm going to talk about. So the challenge that we're all facing, then the technology, district heating versus a shared ground loop arrays, look at some technology comparisons with, with other alternative heat sources, the subsidy support that's available at the moment, a few case studies just so that you can see this uh, system in action, finish with the conclusions, and I'm aiming to speak for no more than 40 minutes. 
uh, so that we've hopefully got some some good time for a bit of a de debate and discussion session at the end. So the challenge facing the UK, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, is that the UK government has set a net zero target by 2050. That in itself is a very challenging target. However, 300 uh, councils in the UK and there's 404 councils in the UK. So, you know, three quarters of them have now declared a climate emergency. And most of them have actually gone further than the UK government, with many of them setting a net zero target by 2030, which is obviously only nine years away. And that is a very, very challenging target, as, as these local authorities are now find, finding out. And in terms of, of, of meeting that target, one of the things we know, do need to look at is, is heat. And heat produces the largest proportion of carbon in the UK. You can see this uh, graph from the Energy Saving Trust, and 37% of all the carbon uh, in the UK is, is coming from heat. But at the moment, only 6.2% of all the heat in the UK is coming from renewables. I'm sure you're all aware that the vast majority of, of heat in the UK is, is still from mains gas. Uh, each year in the UK, we still install about 1.6 million mains gas boilers, whereas uh, ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps combined is about 20 to 25,000 a year. So you can see that tiny, tiny proportion of heat is from the renewables. And if we're going to get close to achieving some of these targets, then we do need to install a lot more heat pumps. And the Committee on Climate Change, they came out a couple of years ago and said they think that we need a minimum of two and a half million heat pumps to be installed by 2030. So obviously, if all we're doing is 20,000 to 25,000 a year at the moment, in 10 years' time, that would get us another 200 or 250,000 installed. So somehow we need to find the best part of two to 2.5 million heat pumps before 2030. So it's a big challenge facing the industry. That's the manufacturers, the installers, the designers, the specifiers. So it's a big, big challenge that it's all facing us. To try and help us get there, the, the government released their 10-point plan for the Green Industrial Revolution back in November 2020. Uh, and I think it was point number seven on the plan is the one that you can see on your screen about how we're going to make homes and schools uh, and all those types of buildings greener. And the target then is to install 600,000 heat pumps every year by 2028. If I take you back to the number I've just told you, which is currently, it's about, 20, let's call it 25,000 a year. If we've got to get from there to 600,000 in the space of seven years, that's a tremendous amount of upskilling uh, and work that's needed within the industry. So, you know, climate change is real. It is a cr crisis that we're all facing. Heat pumps, I genuinely believe, are one of the solutions. But there's a big challenge ahead of us to, to try and meet some of these targets. So if we look at ground source heat pump technology, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the technology, but just, just to understand uh, the process, we've all got a heat pump at home, and I'm sure you're all aware that all a heat pump is is a fridge. The standard refrigeration cycle that is taking place in, inside that box in your home. But what we do with the ground source heat pump is we're moving heat obviously from the from the ground passing it through the refrigeration cycle in the heat pump so that we then have uh, a heat source to to provide central heating via underfloor heating or radiators fan coil units uh, and obviously hot water via a hot water cylinder but the ground source heat pump our heat source is clearly the ground uh, and what we we tend to do usually is we bury plastic pipe within the ground that pipe is filled with a heat transfer fluid and all that heat transfer fluid is is a mixture of water and antifreeze. We circulate that fluid around the ground and it goes in colder than the ground. So typically uh, five degrees cooler than the ground. And we try and gain about five degrees of heat across across that ground. So if it's gone into the ground at five, we're able to bring it back in to the heat pump at about 10 degrees. If it's gone in at zero degrees, we're trying to bring it into the heat pump at about five, deg five degrees. Once that glyco uh, heat transfer fluid is in our ground source heat pump, it just goes into a, a heat exchanger. 
sometimes that will be uh, referred to as an evaporator, but effectively it's a, it's, it's a heat exchanger that on one side has the, the glycol fluid from the ground and on the other side has the refrigerant that's inside the heat pump. Even though the temperature coming in from the ground is relatively low, that's still warm enough to, to boil the refrigerant inside those, the, the heat pump. And then it changes state from a liquid to a gas, but it's still a relatively low temperature and low pressure gas. So the heat pump, the key component in the heat pump is the compressor. And that's the thing that's, that's bobbing up and down, the, the yellow component you see on the screen. And all we do in the compressor inside the, our heat pump is obviously compress that gas. By compressing the gas, obviously all the molecules start bouncing around. Uh, the temperature increases and we now have a high temperature, high pressure gas that we now pass through a second heat exchanger. Some people will refer to it as a condenser, but again, it's just a plate heat exchanger, which on one side has your high temperature, high pressure gas from the refrigerant circuit, and on the other side has the hot water that's flowing in the radiators or the coil in your hot water cylinder. And what we do at this heat exchanger is we aim to transfer about five degrees of heat from the refrigerant circuit into the central heating system. So if the return water from the central heating is coming back at about 40 degrees C, we'll then send it back out at 45 degrees C to the, to the central heating circuit. But then the heat pump itself, that refrigerant, because it's now lost its energy, it changes state back from a gas to a liquid, but it's still a, a high pressure liquid because we haven't done anything to, to reverse the process in the compressor. So what we do is we pass it through an expansion valve. That then means that the physical characteristics of that refrigerant change becomes a low temperature, low pressure gas again, and the, the cycle just, just continues in the heat pump. So the key thing in the heat pump is we have the heat source in the ground. That's usually a closed loop. It's a closed fluid sealed circuit itself. Within the heat pump, you then have your refrigerant circuit, which is also a sealed circuit. And then we have a third circuit, which is the, the homes or the, the industrial buildings central heating circuit. And again, that's a sealed circuit. And we're just transferring heat from one place to another. And the beauty of a heat pump is that in normal operations with a ground source heat pump, you'll buy one unit of electricity, but the heat pump will generate anywhere between three and four units of heat for you. So it's a very efficient process. You've used one unit of, of electricity and we get three or four units of heat going into our building. So that's the basics in the technology. Now, there are different heat sources that you can use with a ground source heat pump. I'm we'll just touching these briefly. We have the horizontal uh, loops. Uh, and typically, uh, when I think of these, I tend to think of Grand Designs and Kevin McLeod standing next to usually a a brand new house that's been built in a rural location in Britain that's got lots of land. And the pipes in, the, in this scenario are, are dug in trenches that are about one to two, two metres below the ground, spread out across a wide area. And uh, that, that's how, how we generate the energy. Relatively cheap uh, to install because it's effectively it's a man and a digger. It's plastic pipe being buried in the ground and it can be done relatively quickly. We still sell a lot of these systems as Kenza, but that's all typically done to your private homeowners, often, as I say, in rural areas uh, and doing a lot of self-build. The vast majority of projects that are done on a large scale is, is when we get to boreholes, uh, the second one along. And this is where we drill closed loop vertical boreholes anywhere up to 240 metres deep, although we've, we've now got some projects where we're going down to about 300 metres deep. The beauty of these is that they're a lot space efficient because obviously we're taking then the energy from the, the rock that's, that's deeper, so we don't need so much surface area. You can drill the boreholes pretty quick. You know, you can, in the right conditions, you could get a 200 metre borehole uh, completely drilled, pipework installed, moved on to the next hole. You could do that all that within about two and two and a half days. But obviously, this is more specialist installation. It does cost more because it's a big civil engineering process. So effectively, you want to be doing this on a big scale. And, and you know, by big scale, I mean multiple residential properties or large scale uh, industrial buildings uh, so that we can start to, to drive the price of the ground source heat pump down. But the vast majority of ground source heat pumps in the UK will be these closed loop vertical boreholes. However, 
you can also make use of, of, of water sources. So if you've got a surface water, so that could be a, a lake, it could be river, it could be even the sea, uh, you can actually just put your pond mats, your heat exchangers in that surface water and just take the energy out of there. Usually tend to be quite cost effective because there's less civil works involved. Uh, not a great deal of maintenance, but obviously it's very site specific and there'll only be certain parts of the UK where you can do that. The other opportunity you've got is, is to use what we call an open loop system. And this is where you're drilling down into the underground aquifer, or you could be, be using flooded uh, mines, which is, which is something that's getting a lot of interest at the moment. Or it could just be simply, you know, an open loop system from a river uh, or something like that. So you're basically taking the water out then, passing it over a, a separate plate heat exchanger to take energy out of it. The water then goes back in cooler into your water source. But off those plate heat exchangers, they then have your standard glycol loop that goes off to the heat pump to get the energy. What you do always have to consider with an open loop system is that you've now obviously got submersible pumps, which will obviously uh, need servicing and maintenance. You've got separate plate heat exchangers. So, you know, typically an open loop system is likely to require more servicing and maintenance. So usually if you've got the opportunity to, a closed loop system is going to be the, the easiest option if you've got the space uh, to do it because of the long term uh, servicing and maintenance requirements. So I'm just going to focus a little bit more on closed loop vertical boreholes because this is typically uh, this, the startup of most large scale systems. The question I get asked a lot is, well, how many boreholes do I need? How much energy can you get out of the ground? And that's often a, a question that's kind of, you know, the same as how long is a piece of string? You know, it's, it's going to depend from site to site. But as rough rule of thumbs and as engineers, we often like a good rule of thumb. Anywhere between 30 to 60 watts per meter is a usual extraction rate out of the ground. So if you drill a 100 meter hole, it's likely that you could to use that to support, say, three to six kilowatts of demand. A 200 meter hole anywhere between six and, and 12 kilowatts of demand. But it all depends on, on how close the boreholes are together. The closer you put them, clearly they're sharing the same ground. So therefore, you can take less energy out. If you can put them farther apart, you can, you can therefore take more energy out of the ground. It also depends on whether it's a heating only system. So you're, all you're doing is taking energy out of the ground and not really be uh, actively recharging it. You're just allowing the ground's natural heat to recharge itself. But if you've got a system that's doing both heating and cooling, obviously during those summer months, the cooling energy is now being rejected to the ground and that allows you to design the, the system differently. And the key one is obviously the geology in the UK is significantly different in all parts. You know, the southwest in Cornwall, where we are based, very good systems down there because they're on uh, often on granite, high thermal conductivity. We get lots of energy. I've done other projects in the East Anglia region. We've got something called the Norwich Crag, which is basically sand all the way down to 90 meters. Not great at conducting energy, so therefore you need more more boreholes for the same heat load in East Anglia as you would do in Cornwall. So it's lots of things to consider, and ultimately you need to be working with a specialist. I thought it might be interesting for you just to see a video. This is typically we're using a water flush drilling method. The thing that's turning around is a drill rod. These usually come in either three meter or six meter lengths. At the bottom of that drill rod is just a, a, a drill bit, much like the drill bit on a drill you'd, you'd use to hang a picture in your wall. That's just clearing out the, the, the spoil and the water's then being pumped back to a sieve called a mud puppy where we take out all the waste and spoil and the water back down the hole to continue the drilling. Once you finish your hole, the top bit of it, we've always got some temporary steel casing because otherwise the hole would collapse. But once the hole's drilled, you can see here the pipe work just coming off a decoiler, just off a telehandler, and that's that pipe work will be, be in that hole very quickly. And as I said earlier, that whole process of drilling a hole about 200 meters deep, you're, you're looking at about two to two and a half days. Important to note the diameter of the hole itself, probably no more than about 150 mil for a closed loop system. But once you've finished putting the pipe work in the hole, it's fundamental that you put drought into that hole so that you get good thermal contact between the, the surrounding geology and the pipe work and obviously then into the, the fluid itself so we get that heat transfer. So the key design considerations, 
ultimately, like any heating system, a ground source heat pump system will only work if it's been designed properly up front by someone that knows what they're doing. The first thing we need to understand is the loads of the building. So we do need to understand the peak load, you know, i.e. that kilowatt number that we need on, on the coldest days of the year to make sure the building's warm or equally on, on those days in summer if it's a cooling system as well to make sure that the, the building is going to be comfortable. But as well as the peak, we do have to understand the annual or monthly or, or, or ideally the hourly demand uh, because it's both the peak uh, in kilowatts and these hourly demands in kilowatt hours, both of them will drive the design of, of the system. And obviously the more detail uh, that you can give, the better. I was interested to note that one of the sponsors of Ashray's is obviously the IES software. And I know on, on, on lots of the bigger commercial projects, the consulting engineers are using software like IES. And from that, you're obviously able to, to get these peak annual monthly hourly loads. So that's fundamental importance. We need that in order to be able to size the system. So obviously sizing the right size of heat pump, but then sizing the groundery. Another key one for, for ground source heat pumps and any heat pump for that matter is flow temperature. You know, a lot of projects are coming to me now because there's a lot of interest in heat pumps and people are just going, well, I was going to put a gas boiler in there that was going to run at 80 degrees. So I'm now just going to put a ground source heat pump in there and run that at 80 degrees. No, ground source heat pumps work more efficiently at the lowest possible flow temperatures. So ideally, we want to be designing our space heating systems to be working at flow temperatures of, in my opinion, 50 degrees or less. Ideally, 45 degrees. If we can make it 40, it will be even better. But they are the kind of flow temperatures we need to be working to. A bit more of a challenge in a retrofit building, uh, where potentially, you know, we might need to be sticking at, say, a 50 flow or 55 degree flow for, for space heating. So it's a bit of a compromise in efficiency, but it's balancing it with the size of the heat emitters. But if we've got a new building, it's being designed from scratch. In my opinion, there's no reason why we can't design all our heating distribution systems to suit the, the efficiency benefits of a heat pump and get, get these designed at low temperatures. And that's why often you'll see underfloor heating discussed with, with ground source heat pumps, because obviously with the large surface areas of underfloor heating, we can usually uh, run the systems at the lowest flow temperatures. But as designers of systems, flow temperature is something we have got control over and please try and get that as low as you possibly can. It's also important that we look at the domestic hot water provision. Heat pumps can do domestic hot water uh, because, you know, they can run in modes that, that they'll do 60, 65 degree uh, flows into a cylinder. So they can do your domestic hot water, but we do, again, need to understand that provision and we need to understand how a heat pump is different to a gas boiler. It's not just going to chuck 80 degrees into a tank. So we can we can get away with uh, you know those flow temperatures getting us out of jail. We do need to design these systems correctly, and we do need to consider the flow temperature that's coming in, and therefore what storage capacity do we need, and you know how we're going to cope with peaks in our daily hot water demand uh, and and reheat times. So it can be done with heat pumps. We just need to think about it. Cooling. Typically not often in residential, or I'm starting to see this more in, on the new build, and certainly in luxury uh, properties within uh, urban environments. But certainly in your commercial spaces, clearly these buildings are going to be, be requiring cooling. And the beauty with a ground source heat pump is that cooling energy can be rejected back into the ground. By rejecting it into the ground, we help uh, recharge the ground, so we raise the temperature of the ground, which will actually then Make the whole system more efficient when we get to the to the to the summer uh, so the, to the winter months, uh, and we need space heating. So having a good understanding of cooling, and then it's again an accurate peak load and the uh, the annual monthly and hourly demand. And clearly, we need to understand the heat source. You know, is it is it a closed loop system? Is it an open loop system? Are we are we trying to do something fancy uh, with mine water or, or in a lake? And fundamentally. When we're looking at the ground, employ a certified geo exchange designer. And this effectively means that someone's been on the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association accredited training course. They've been proved that they know how to use software, they understand the geology, and they can design these systems. And I can't stress that e enough. If, if you get one part of a ground source heat pump system wrong, so if the ground array is wrong or the size of the heat pump itself is wrong, 
or the heat emitters are designed at the wrong flow temperature, the system won't work. But I, I believe that with our, our current engineering skills, we do understand how to, to size systems correctly. We can work on the flow temperature. So therefore, the bit that perhaps the industry is not that familiar with is the ground. And at that point, let's work with the experts and get the certified geo exchange designers involved. So this leads me on to, you know, what have, what have we been doing uh, as an industry? And often what we've, we've done over the past few years and policies often driven us down this, this route is a district heating solution. And a district heating solution is usually you have a large uh, central plant, which, you know, has often recently been a combined heat power plant or maybe gas boiler plant. And some of these I'm starting now to see people maybe even looking at biomass or, or, or heat pumps. But a central plant is usually generating high temperature uh, hot water. Usually you're going to have some form of heat accumulators or, or buffer tanks or stores, which are helping to, to store that energy. But you have a network then of pipe work uh, going around the, the city or, or the, the buildings. Uh, it's at high temperature, often at 80 degrees flow uh, and trying to keep the returns as low as possible. And then once you're in individual buildings, you're then obviously distributing it through riser pipe work. A, and going off into individual heat interface units or HIUs in the residential apartments and even something similar in the, in the commercial buildings. But what you have with that is that one entity has to own that central energy centre, so you're going to have to uh, develop an ESCO who will then own that plant and maintain that plant, and then they will sell, obviously, heat onto all those individual building owners. Those building, building owners will have to buy their heat from... From that company they have no choice and at the moment that is an unregulated market uh, and it becomes a uh, quite a complex system there's metering and billing involved obviously to make sure that those people uh, are paying the right amount for, for their energy uh, and obviously that plan that is fundamental that that's working because if that goes down you could leave several hundred or thousands of buildings without heating and hot water and they're not going to be happy. And, you know, Google's a wonderful thing. If you go on there today and just Google district heating problems and systems with issues, you, you'll, you'll find them. It's, it's not that difficult. But often what people think I'm going to do is go, well, you know, we can still do district heating with ground source heat pumps. Just cross out that combined heat and power plant, put ground source heat pump instead, and, and we'll do the same thing. But you'll still have all these same problems. You know, you're overheating in your risers and corridors complex system to be maintained. And obviously, I've already pointed out that ground source heat pumps ideally work best in higher efficiency at lower flow temperatures, whereas these existing networks tend to work at high temperatures. So what we've been pioneering over the past few years and, and, and working on is our what we've been calling shared ground loop array. But I, I think now within the industry is often now referred to an ambient loop or even a fifth generation district heating network. But what we have in, in this scenario is that we have a ground array and the ground array size will depend on the, the buildings that it's heat load has got to satisfy in the geology and all those points we, we touched on earlier. But that ground array is now not circulating water at a high temperature, it's very much a low temperature circulation and typically speaking anywhere between zero degrees and, and 20 degrees. And with that network so it's still a network of pipes in the ground much like it was with district heating but because it's a low temperature we don't need those highly insulated pipes in the ground to try and reduce heat loss and when it, we go above ground and we're going uh, through risers it doesn't need to to, to be highly insulated to, to overcome problems of overheating and risers and corridors we actually need to insulate it to just stop condensation forming in the pipework so all we have now is a network of, of effectively uninsulated or, or, or very little insulated pipe work running to all our buildings and then each individual building has its own ground source heat pump connected to that network and that ground source heat pump will be under the control of that building owner whether it's a, a residential apartment or whether it's a commercial building and they will just switch on and on their on and off their heat pump to satisfy their own heating and hot water demand they will pay their bill directly to their electricity supplier and a, it's a very, very simple system. In many ways, it mimics the traditional gas framework, which is obviously been the mainstay of, of, of heating systems in the UK. 
And the beauty of an ambient loop or a shared ground loop or rare fifth generation district heating is there's many ways that we can bring that heat source back to ambient temperature. So yes, we've got the vertical closed loop boreholes that, that I've talked about and open loop systems, but if we've got data centers requiring lots of cooling, let's grab that energy and put it back in, in to the ambient loop. In London, if we've got the waste heat from underground uh, tubes, let's take that waste heat, feed it back into our ambient loop. If we've got PVT panel, so a PVT panel is, is generating electricity, but it also has a thermal element behind it. The thermal element cools down the PV panels to make them more efficient, but that thermal element could be linked to our ambient network to raise the temperature. So we get a win-win situation with the PV panels being more efficient, but the ground array being more efficient. So there's lots of way that our ambient loop could be brought back to temperature to feed all these heat pumps uh, in our buildings. And you can see there that you know what ideally we, we envisage is you have you have this on a city-wide scale. You know, instead of the mains gas pipework running through everyone's city, you have an ambient loop pipework running through everyone's city, and then they can connect to the individual heat pump in that building. You know, we could make that transition today to a low carbon heating system. I'll just touch on this, but you can, as I've said earlier, you can do cooling through the ground source heat pumps. You can do it passively. So during the, the winter months, we've actually cooled down the, the ground array because we've been using the energy to heat our buildings. So in summer, if you've got chilled water that's already in our ambient loop, you could directly actually connect that to some fan coil units in the building. That's your, you're actually doing cooling. You're not actually switching the heat pump on at that point very energy efficient because they only need circulation pumps. But you can clearly use a ground source heat pump as well to provide chilled water for you. Yes, it's going to consume more electricity, but there's obviously going to be some applications where you, you, you want a specific chilled water temperature. But all I would say at that point is in heating mode, to get the ground source heat pumps as efficient as possible, we want them to work in the lowest possible flow temperature. So in cooling mode, to get the systems as efficient as possible, we just want them to work on the highest possible flow temperature. So, you know, trying to move away from a standard chilled water design of perhaps 612, can, can we increase that flow temperature? Instead of 612, could we make it 12, 1218 or something like that? Can we eke out some efficiency from our systems? So that's the ground source heat pump. What can we compare them against? Well, often uh, we're compared against mains gas boilers. And, and what you'll find is, unfortunately, at the moment, mains gas is still about three times cheaper, four times cheaper per unit than electricity. So mains gas boiler in terms of running cost is pretty much the same. However, what's driving the market at the moment is carbon. And this graph you can see here uh, that was produced by uh, it should, and it's low carbon heat, heat pumps in London, shows the black line across the middle, that's the carbon content of mains gas. And it's not expected to change much over the the periods until 2050. But the grey line that's coming down, that's the, the grid electrical uh, capacity, sorry, uh, carbon content. And you can see that that's expected to continue to decarbonize to 2050 because we'll have more renewable electricity on the grid, perhaps more nuclear. But obviously a ground source heat pump is going to be at least 300% efficient, maybe even 400% efficient. And what you see is the, the light green lines uh, with the, the light green line being a heat pump that's, uh, you know, running at, say, a, a, a around 65 degrees, so it's more around the 250% efficient. And the darker green line is, is running at 35 degrees, so it's more like 400% efficient. But what you can see is, by 2050, the carbon content of heat produced by a ground source heat pump is tiny in comparison to a gas boiler. So therefore, it does have a place uh, if we're, if we're going to tackle climate change. And the other one just to touch on is I'm sure hydrogen is something that you've been discussing and you've probably even had some presentations on it. But a ground source heat pump is about six to eight times more efficient than hydrogen at converting electricity to heat. So roughly speaking, if you have one unit of electricity and you want to get one unit of heat from hydrogen, uh, you'll need actually two units of electricity in that case. So one unit of electricity will only give you 0 0.5 units of heat from a hydrogen uh, system, whereas one unit of electricity with a ground source heat pump is likely to get you at least three units of heat or possibly even four units of heat. So therefore, ground source heat pump six to eight times more efficient than hydrogen at converting electricity to heat. And I think 
that's often a fundamental point that's missed in the, the big debate about hydrogen. You know, I think hydrogen does have its place in the UK, but I'm not convinced that we should just move from burning gas to now burning hydrogen in boilers. And if you just look at these numbers in some tables, uh, and I can make these slides available uh, via uh, via data so everyone can have access to them. But ultimately, you know, the carbon intensity at the moment using SAP 10.1, grid electrics about 0 0.136 kilograms of carbon uh, for every kilowatt hour uh, for a grid electric. You apply the efficiency of uh, a ground source heat pump. So the carbon intensity of heat today is around about the 0 0.045 kilograms of carbon for every one kilowatt hour of heat produced. Compare that to any other technology, and you can see that the ground source heat pump does have the, the lowest uh, carbon emissions. If we compare it against the mains gas boiler, which is at 0 0.247 kilograms of CO2, you can see that we're, we're somewhere around the 70 to 80 percent reduction if we were to switch away from, from mains gas to ground source heat pumps. So it, from a carbon perspective, it's clearly got a future. I'm often asked ground source heat pumps versus air source heat pumps. I, as Darren alluded to, I've, I've worked for an air source heat pump manufacturer in the past. I'm certainly not here to come and bash air source heat pumps. There's lots of pros and cons, but in very simple terms, my own opinion is for a ground source heat pump, it will cost you more to install. So the capital expenditure is no doubt higher because we've got a lot of groundworks required. So there's a lot of, we do need more space and clearly there's going to be more disruption. So there's no doubt about it, a ground source heat pump and those two points has got a harder, harder uh, job than an air source heat pump. But for everything else, I, I do strongly believe that the ground source heat pump is the better option. So it's going to be more efficient, lower carbon emissions, lower running costs. There's nothing outside that's vulnerable. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a, a long term system that is easy to maintain and it's very reliable. You've got the ability to do the passive cooling with an ambient loop solution. There's no metering and billing. So there's lots, lots of ways that a ground source heat pump, I think, is better than an air source heat pump. But fundamentally, I guess it will come back to, are those long-term benefits worth paying for up front? I believe they are. But I guess in many projects, it's, it's, it's often seen as, as, you know, how much is it going to cost me on day one? And that's the most important thing. Running cost is clearly an important thing to consider. The, all this table is trying to do is take some, some standard tables uh, running costs uh, from base. So these are base tables 2.24, 2.3.4. And basically, that's the average UK price of, of electricity and gas. So you can see there, so 16.6p for grid electric, 3.79p for a mains gas boiler. And then just factoring in some efficiency. So for the heat, Ground source heat pump. I've just stuck at three hundred percent. It's not not the greatest efficiency, but it's you know it's a realistic efficiency in the real world. Uh, often when we're looking at retrofit buildings and relatively high flow temperatures of 50, 55 degrees, and for a mains gas boiler, looking at about you know an efficiency of eighty five percent. So it's you know a relatively new system. And what you'll find is the delivered heat cost per kilowatt hour. Unfortunately, at the moment, a mains gas boiler is still cheaper. Four point four six p a kilowatt hour versus about five and a half P for a, a ground source heat pump. And, you know, yes, the ground source heat pump is more, more efficient, but the cost of gas is still very cheap in the UK. So therefore, a typical small flat, five and a half thousand kilowatt hours cost a year. At the moment, mains gas is still your cheaper option, unless you then factor in the annual standing charge. So obviously, if we, if we don't have to bring mains gas to a building, you now don't have the mains gas standing charge, which is typically around £94. If you, Yes, there's a standing charge for grid electric, but you're going to have that standing charge regardless because people want their lights and appliances on. So if you allow that you don't need to apportion that standing charge to the, to the ground source heat pump running cost, then you can see that potentially there's a small running cost saving to be made ground source heat pump by mains gas boiler. I usually just say to people, they have usually end up costing the same. The central plant system is an interesting one to consider because the unit cost of heat from, from what I've seen from most central plants is similar to the unit cost of a ground source heat pump. But there's often a very high standing charge to cope with the ongoing maintenance and delivery of that central plant system. 
and therefore often central plant systems are a lot more expensive than heat pumps and even mains gas boilers. But one thing I'm just going to touch on is, is time of use tariffs. Everything that I've spoken about is using fixed price tariffs, but what we're seeing now is a lot of interest in time of use tariffs and one of them being Octopus Agile. We're involved in a project where the, the residents will have the, the time of use tariffs from Octopus Agile. And this gives you a different electricity price for every half an hour. And the tariffs are published at 4 p.m. every day. And they will let you know tomorrow what's going to happen every half an hour from midnight uh, to midnight uh, so that you can work out when's the best time to, to switch on my, my, uh, my heat pump. And you can see the agile cost there. For most of the day, from midnight to about 3, 4 o'clock, it's hovering around the 10p a unit. There's then that peaks peak demand at between three o'clock and eight o'clock, where it could potentially go up to close to 30p a unit, and then it comes very cheap again. Now, what you have here with the bars going through the graph is just saying, well, this is typical times where we might run, run a heating system, and that would obviously cost you a certain amount of electricity. And if you're on the agile tariff, you can see that certainly in the, the evening slot, some of that is actually at the, the very expensive times. So what we... Sorry, what we can do, click the wrong button, is we can actually just time shift. So we can time shift when we switch the heat pumps on if we're controlling this uh, with smart controls. And by time shifting, we're still maintaining a comfort temperature for the occupant. They still have enough heating and hot water. But by doing a bit of time shifting, we're using a much cheaper uh, electricity price. And therefore, we get to a situation where we have lower running costs for the residents, but also we're trying to trying to move that electricity demand out of those peak demands we help to stabilize the grid and we're doing a bit of grid balancing. And I really see the time of use tariffs, grid balancing, smart controls is, is going to be the future. I'm just briefly going to touch on subsidy support. I'm not going to go on along because it's a bit of a mess at the moment, if I'm being brutally honest. You can see there that seven different schemes where potentially clients may be able to to get some money to install a ground source heat pump system. But equally, those specific schemes have lots of rules, lots of eligibility criteria, and it's a bit of a minefield. I guess the long and the short of it is there is money out there. Depending on the specifics of your project, it might well be that you can get some subsidy support from central government. At that point, if there's a specific project, go and speak to your, you, you know, the companies that understand this and, and see what they can do for you. And then just to conclude, just uh, I think I've got three case studies here. I've just concentrated them all in the, the residential ambient loop sector because that's predominantly what I've been working on over the past few years. One of the first big projects I've been involved in down for Enfield Council, eight tower blocks, 13 stories each, 402 flats in total. And what they've installed there is an ambient loop. It's the vertical closed loop boreholes. These are then being shared uh, across all the, the tower blocks. And what we've got then is an individual ground source heat pump in each flat, an individual hot water cylinder linked to a space heating circuit, which is in this case radiators. And the residents then control all this by themselves. And you can see there that the, the carbon savings are estimated to be around about 773 tonnes a year. Uh, and the running cost, the previous heating system was a direct electric system, so very, very expensive. It was costing the residents about £900 a year. But the ground source heat pump system is now down to no more than £350 a year. Uh, and, and from what the residents are saying, that's what they're achieving. And this gives you an idea. There's the four tower blocks, uh, so one half of the site. The red dots are the boreholes that we had to install. And it was roughly speaking about 50, 50 boreholes, so about 200 metres deep to do those uh, four tower blocks. So, yes, we do need some space. You can see there. We needed space, but it wasn't a lot of space. You know, these are tower blocks in London. They, they had some small car parks, some small grassy areas, uh, and, you know, it was able to be done. So perhaps not as much space as you think might be needed in order to do such a, such a large project. Another project I've been involved in, uh, and I've, I've shared this one because I know that you, you all had a presentation from Sunamp uh, last, last month. And this project actually features ground source heat pump technology and phase change thermal store technology. It's a nice uh, uh, project that shows how those technologies can work together. This again, another system up in, in, in Sunderland this time. 
364 properties across seven tower blocks. But what's interesting about this one is it's using uh, the underground aquifer. So there wasn't enough space, unfortunately, at this site to, to put the closed loop boreholes in. That field that you can see there, unfortunately, wasn't part of the part of the site. That was a separate school field, so we couldn't put the boreholes in there. So it's underground aquifer. We've got two boreholes uh, across four different individual sites for these tower blocks. Water pumped up from the aquifer that's about 60 metres deep, passed through some heat exchangers, back down a, another borehole that's about 100 metres away, and then individual heat pumps, hot water cylinders, which in this case was the phase change thermal store, and then uh, a, a new central heating system. This one's saving about uh, 420 tonnes of, of carbon per annum over across these tower blocks. And it can be done in new build. And this project's a, a large residential development down in Bristol. Bristol is quite uh, an interesting one because they've changed their planning requirements to, to already force people away from installing gas boilers. You know, that boiler ban is set to come in through the future home standards and building regulations in about 2025. But Bristol have gone one step further and effectively ruled it out from now. So there's lots of new build developments looking at, at heat pumps. This one's 160 flats and 190 houses. And again, it's another shared ambient look. Vertical closed loop boreholes, individual heat pumps in each property, a hot water cylinder to do the hot water. And then some of these properties will have underflow heating and some of them will have uh, radiators in. So you can see it can be done in a number of buildings. The next, the next case study I'm hoping to that we could we could work to is a site that shows your residential element, but it does have your commercial buildings on as well. Ken's has done many projects where it's ground source heat pumps that are feeding commercial buildings but it'd be great to get one that's an ambient look mixing both your residential and your commercial. So just a couple of conclusions from myself, you know, low carbon emissions, you know, that is what is driving the interest in ground source heat pumps. They, they, I, in my opinion, and I think the stats back up, they are the lowest carbon uh, heat source that you can have in the UK. So it's good for showing building regulations compliance, but more importantly, for tackling climate change. It's also important to note, there's no point of use NOx or SOx emissions, Air quality is a big issue in our in our cities. And obviously, yes, it is using grid electric. And if that grid electric come from a power station, clearly there's there's emissions there, but but that's at the power station end in our in our cities. Uh, if we put more of the heat pumps in and reduce the gas boilers, that will certainly help to improve air quality. Lowest energy bills of any technology, they're very efficient and reliable. So, you know, the heat pump units itself expecting them to last for around 25 years. Your ground array should be lasting at least 100 years. So, you know, typically longer than, than the building that it's built for. And it's completely unobtrusive. You know, there's no visual impact there. So, you know, the technology is well developed. It has been deployed at scale. You know, uh, there's more we can do. But, you know, hopefully that's giving you a bit of a flavour about a ground source heat pump technology. But specifically, you know, shared ground loop arrays or ambient loops, which I think you'll, you'll all be hearing more about as we move as we move through the next few years. So that concludes my presentation, and yeah, happy to take uh, uh, questions and uh, and answers from everyone. I, I don't know if they're in the chat or if we just just open it up. If I just stop sharing my screen, Darren, I don't know don't know how you want to play that. Um, I think. Uh, uh, I think uh, you can keep your screen on if anyone's got any questions they can come online and ask or they can type them in the box whichever really sort of suits them if we have any questions yeah unfortunately i can't see any questions if they're coming in the chat by sharing my screen unfortunately i'm, I'm just trying to look uh, find that myself actually uh, <laughs> oh, here we go show conversation uh, Okay, so we have a question from Charlie, uh, Charlie Wimmer Hode. Hi, Stuart. Are time of use tariffs in use anywhere? And if so, have they proven effective both on energy use and customer use? Yep. So, a uh, Octopus Agile do have a commercially available time of use tariff. I uh, and I know it is being used because uh, our, our director actually is, is doing that in his own home. He's unsurprisingly got a ground source heat pump and he's got an electric vehicle. So he himself is. Is certainly a great advocate of them because he, he says it's completely slashed his energy bill. But uh, we are uh, working with uh, some housing associations who are putting ground source heat pumps in 
and they're also trying to move their their residents over to time of use tariffs. So there's one project we're working on, Energy Super Hub Oxford, a, a got Innovate UK funding, and a, at the moment it's just it's just got a 50 50 houses in, in involved, but we are in the process of moving those residents over to time of use tariffs. I I don't have any real data yet from from that scheme because as I say it's in the process. Unfortunately, COVID's that should have all tenants should have moved over last year, but COVID's made that very difficult because we do obviously need to to work quite closely with the residents. But that project is being monitored by Oxford University, uh, and no doubt they'll be publishing you know information that in due course. But our modelling shows that you should expect. Uh, that with a time of use tariff, a further 25% savings. So you know, the ground source heat pump saving against conventional bills with a time of use tariff, all the modeling points that it should be a further 25% saving. So you know, hopefully uh, over the course of this year, there, there'll be some uh, some interesting news coming out about that one. Great, thank you. I've just, I can see people typing. Uh... <clears throat> OK, thanks. That's good to hear. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, uh, OK, I have a comment from Martin. Great presentation in the case studies. Who pays for the ground loop pumps energy? So uh, that energy is, is effectively given free of charge to the residents. So obviously in those examples I'm showing you, it's, it's, it's predominantly been social housing providers. So they the social housing providers paid for the whole system and the resident then pays for their heat via their electricity bill but there is no energy being consumed anywhere in the system so there is no central circulation pump i didn't actually make that clear in my presentation so the systems are designed so there is no central circulation pump so that closed loop array uh, goes all the way from the ground through through the the, the risers and then to the heat pump and the first circulation pump you get to is a small, uh, basically domestic circulator inside the shoebox heat pump. So if all the heat pumps are off, the system is not consuming any energy, and therefore, you know, the landlord in this case isn't, hasn't got a bill to pay. As soon as one heat pump comes on, say in one flat, that resident pays for their heat through their electricity bill because the circulation is being done by the pump that's in their heat pump. And that's connected to the electric bill. So effectively, in all the, the, the scenarios we've seen, the heat from the ground is effectively to be given free of charge to the residents, and they just pay for their heat through through their electric bill. I think what we'll, we'll find as we move forward is that the government incentives won't be there to enable housing associations, councils, and private developers and the like to actually sort of take the government incentive to pay for the insulation, and then the running cost savings are all just just handed down to to the residents. So I think what what will what we'll ultimately see is probably something similar to to what's been done in a central plant system, and there will become sort of an annual connection fee or an annual standing charge, whatever you want to describe it, and that that will be basically paying, giving the 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 income to the owner of the ground array. So you know if if the ground array is now owned by the landlord or a utility company, they've they've made the investment and put it in. But in order for them to recoup some of that investment, they will probably have a standing charge, which could be anywhere, I guess, between, say, £100 a year to £300 a year. And that's not actually paying for them to, to buy heat in any way or, 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 or buy uh, electricity because there's nothing being consumed. But it's basically paying for them to, to get to recoup their, their, their investment costs. So I hope that's answered the question. I realise I've, I've covered a few different things there. but uh, you know that there is there is nothing the, the ground array itself isn't consuming any anything there's there's no bill to be paid for that it's all done inside the individual properties themselves so it's effectively free but i think the long-term business models will mean that somehow there will be a there will be some form of annual standing charge levied on householders to effectively pay for this and in, this infrastructure Thank you. That's answered that. Yeah, answered that very well. Um, Martin's actually said thank you for, for answering that. I have another Great. question. <clears throat> Excuse me. This uh, another question now is from Amir uh, Suleiman. He says, uh, hi, Stuart. Many thanks for the presentation. Isn't there a risk of expensive failures since the plant is underground? A, 
yes, in, in theory, you you could have have failures with the boreholes. I mean, I've I've been in the industry now fifteen years, and a there's been there's been no failure in the ground that isn't been caused by a human error. So the boreholes themselves, once they're installed, the pipework is grouted in, so the boreholes are securely into the uh, you know tied to the geology. So that that bit itself, there's there's you know effectively zero risk of that collapsing or or, or causing any problem. The pipework itself, uh, we use HDPE, so high density polyethylene. So it's exactly the same pipework that we use for mains gas, uh, which obviously has lots of reg strict regulations to make sure that that's not about to leak. Uh, and it's the same pipework that's used now in, in mains water. So the pipework itself is very robust, uh, and those pipework manufacturers actually. They give, a, they give a guarantee in the pipework of usually at least 50 years. It's kind of a meaningless pipework because if, if the pipe was to fail, it, you know, your question is absolutely right and it would cost money because they, they will replace the pipe, but you would have to redrill a borehole. So, you know, if that was to happen, it, it would be very costly. But as I say, the pipework is very robust, very reliable. And in all, in all my time doing ground source heat pumps, we've had no failures other than human error. So by human error, I mean... Someone has come along at a later date, not done a proper survey scan to identify the marker tape that's, that's laid above the pipework to, to tell you that there's something down there and don't dig. And, you know, they put a JCB dig up <clears throat> straight through the straight through the pipework as it's coming back to, to the building. And clearly, in, in that case, if you put if you put a, a, a dig up through this pipework, it, it does it does cause a problem. But, you know, it's a problem that can be solved. So, yeah. I think people do do view it as a risk. There's lots of stuff underground, but in, in my in my experience of the industry, it's it's reliable stuff. It doesn't fail, and and you know I don't think that's a risk that people should be worried about. Thank you. Yep, yeah, that sort of answers a follow up question uh, in terms of how common are these failures. <clears throat> so thank you for that. We have a question from uh, from Maru. Um, a uh, question from Maru is: uh, Do we have enough skills in the UK to install these properly? <laughs> that's a that's an excellent question. Uh, the the good thing is, when you the bit of installing the heat pump itself inside the property, if you've got a competent competent heating engineer who's is good at installing gas boilers, then there is no reason why they can't also install a ground source heat pump, i.e. the above ground pipe. What I do use the word competent uh, heating engineer because I. I often work with with people who have been installing boilers many years, but I'm not sure they're necessarily a competent heating engineer. And I'm not I'm not trying to be disrespectful out there, but I think often there's there's maybe a difference between a plumber and a heating engineer. Uh, but you know, manufacturers like ourselves at Kenza, what we are trying to do is is actually work with existing existing plumbers, existing gas boiler installers and take them on this journey you know if we're going to install 600,000 heat pumps a year by 2028 we have to work with the with the existing installer base so often in many of our projects that we deliver as Kenza contracting we actually work with your local installer who has been in, you know working with the housing association or the council for many years and has installed hundreds if not thousands of gas boilers but we 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 train them up on how to install the above ground bit, i.e. the heat pump inside the properties. And there is a lot of fear to begin with because it's new. But actually what they realize is it isn't that much different to a boiler. You know, if we've taken the responsibility of the design, so we've made sure, for example, the radiators are sized correctly and we'll work at 45 degrees. These guys do know how to install radiators and wall and they know how to install pipe lots of radiators. If we tell them what to do, they will get that bit right. If we show them how to install the heat pump, and the key bit difference in the heat pump is, you know, flushing through the ground array, making sure it's filled correctly with antifreeze. And that bit, if we train them up properly, they can get it right. I think the other bit you have to bear in mind with the ground source heat pump is obviously there's the below ground bit. And do we have enough skills to do that? Usually, in my experience, even though the ground bit is in some ways the hardest bit of it because it's, it's big civils engineering and... Uh, you know, you're, you're causing a lot of disruption and then goodness knows how many things can go wrong as soon as you start drilling up to 250 metres below ground. However, the drillers are very good at what they do. They are very experienced. They are very good at drilling holes and they're very good at putting pipework in the holes. 
So I think I think we do have the skills to do the boreholes. In terms of, of ramping it up, we clearly don't have enough to get up to six. You know, if all those ground source heat pumps were 600,000 a year by 2028, we clearly need a lot more, more drilling capacity and skills, but I think we can get it. I do, I do think we can, we can work with the existing installer base to get them to be able to install ground source heat pumps. But I do, unfortunately, I think there has been some de skilling of the, the sector over, over many years. And, you know, there's a lot of, of people when they install, for example, you know, a gas boiler in a residential property, I don't believe proper heat loss calculations are being carried out to, to, to size that boiler correctly. I don't believe proper heat loss calculations are being carried out to size the radiators correctly. And, I, and unfortunately, I think that all the condensed or a lot of the condensing gas boilers that have been installed in the UK, they won't actually be condensing because the installer base is just switching that gas boiler on. It's running at 80 degrees. The return water is at 60 degrees. It's therefore not cool enough and we're not getting condensing boilers. So I, I, I think we can work with the existing installer base and we can upscale them, but it, it will be a challenge. And I, I think we're maybe starting from a low base because I, I, I think there's been some, some descaling of them. So I hope that answers the question. It's probably been a bit long-winded way, Danny. Uh, no, I think uh, I think it does. I think that it certainly points out there, you know, recognises there's going to be some challenges challenges ahead of us um, as we make this transition in terms yeah. of. Uh, uh, and I and I talk from I say from experience with a very <laughs> friend of mine, uh, you know, best friend for 25 years or well, 25 26 years. We served in the Royal Navy together. He uh, he, he works in the heat pump market and. Ah, okay. uh, yeah, uh, Peter. Yeah, I think you know him actually, Peter Strong. I think you went to school with him actually. Small work. Ah, Peter Strong. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but he, uh, yeah, he's come across many installations where he's been called out to put things right, um, and, and yeah, it really echoes that that piece you said about the uh, the, the skills, um, where we had these sort of RHI. Well, we've got the RHI, for example. There's a lot of companies that suddenly set up to offer these uh, these technologies, but actually the people behind those companies don't, in, in fact, have the skill sets themselves from the salespeople that go in and, and offer the, the technology and, and the people that install. So there's been an element, I believe, and we believe, um, that sort of gives, gives the sort of new technology a bit of a bad name if it's not installed correctly. But, I mean, that applies to any technology ultimately. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you, Dan. And I think, you know, I think why Ken's a contracting, why we've been successful over the past few years is, We've not done what most manufacturers do. You know, most manufacturers will obviously have a product and then go out to an installer base. And and what we found is that no one had the skills to really install ground source heat pumps. And therefore, if 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 we're going to get more ground source heat pumps installed and grow the market, that's why Kenza Contracting was born. And effectively, clients clients get a one-stop shop where we, we will bring in people to work under us as subcontractors, but they know that we have designed the system. And fundamentally, I think a lot of heat pump systems where they haven't worked, yes, it's, it's easy to blame the, the way it's been installed and there's many factors. But, you know, I've, as I say, I've been in this 15 years, much like your, your, your friend Peter there, and I've been called out to many systems. And, and unfortunately, I've even been to some systems where you could actually say, well, the installer's actually probably installed this correctly but it will never work because whoever designed it mm. didn't know what they were doing <laughs> you know yeah. the ground the ground array is too small the heat emitter you know i've seen it countless times where the heat emitters have been designed for 80 degree flow and someone's put a heat pump in there whether it's ground source or air source and the maximum flow temperature it can do is 55 that that house will never get warm <laughs> it's, it's impossible but the heat pump gets the bad name and you know i think I, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of a lot of people in the, the call here have been involved in the industry at many different levels, and I'm sure there's some designers here. And you know, whatever the system you're installing, I'm sure they they back me up by saying fundamentally we need to get the design right. If we get the design right from day one, yes, an installer can go in and do a bad job, but fundamentally designed right, we can fix those installation problems. So I think you know, let's get the design right, and 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 you know, work work to up, upscale the installer base to make sure that they install install the systems correctly as per the right design. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just trying to see if we have any other questions. I think that's that's all the questions we have. Um, well, Stuart, certainly from uh, on behalf of myself, Maru and, and the rest of the team and all of our chapter members, thank you ever so much for 
for the time you've afforded us this evening. And it's been a very impressive presentation, very informative, um, very enjoyable. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. I just realised my camera's not on. People probably couldn't see me, but yeah, thanks, Darren. Uh, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this opportunity. If people ever have any questions, or as I say, you know, maybe once COVID's gone, we could we could do a live a live site, come and see some borehole drilling. You know, that'd be. I'm sure people would probably find that interesting to see that. Yeah, we bring the masters, the students, and we organise the Ashley event, Darren. Yeah, absolutely. To yeah. get research promotion. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, let's say, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get through this pandemic at some point and, and we can all we can all meet up on site and do that. So you're happy, happy to have those discussions offline with you, Darren, at some point in the future. No problem. Certainly will. Absolutely. I certainly look to take you up on that. Thank you. No worries. Great stuff. I think someone's typing. It tells me Amir's typing. Maybe there's another final question. Nope, nope. The bubbles have gone. <laughs> <laughs> you get these little bubbles bouncing and uh, someone's typing, but uh, it seems to go, oh, no. False alarm. Right, thank yeah. you. I mean, it was a false alarm. Um, no problem. Okay. Um, well, again, thanks. Thanks again, Stuart. And uh, yeah, we look forward to being in touch with you uh, very soon. To to well, certainly when we can arrange such visits. Let's put it that way. We probably need to hold back a little bit. And I always like to be optimistic, but uh, sometimes the goalposts are moving lately, aren't they, with the uh, restrictions? So indeed. <laughs> yeah. But thanks. Thanks, everyone. Nice thanks to meet you, so and uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Bye.